thank you so much for doing this. I mean, really and truly, I, uh, I guess this is one of my perks for getting to do this. I get to catch up with some people that I really like. Can you know how you got into the Austin City Limits? Oh, wow. Let's see. We'll backtrack a little bit. I went to uh, University of Texas from 68 to 73 um, in the electrical engineering department, but the most fun was I kept going over to the music department side to play the jazz drums in the uh, UT Jazz Band with Dick Goodwin, okay. which is where I met you know, a lot of my core musician friends that I st am still in touch with today. And um, somewhere along the way, after I graduated and, and, uh, and all that, I just was looking around for uh, some employment like in a recording studio. At the time, I thought in my mind that you know all the uh, recording places would be like going to work for uh, you know for Capitol Records or Apple or something like that, and realize that no, it's most of the studios in town were privately owned. So I found myself down on Sixth uh, Street, with uh, where I met uh, Malcolm Harper, and and uh, he was putting together an air an airstream remote truck exactly, at the time. Right. and uh, and uh, Chris Christopher Cross was Chris Geppert at the time, right? And he had a corner of a studio that he was building and collecting equipment, and along with uh, Chet Himes and. Greg Klingensmith and Steve Shields and oh, uh, wow. J. Aaron Podolnik. And um, so my first couple years before the Austin City Limits, the, uh, where I ended up finding employment, you know, that was you know, something better than just scraping carpet off of the old floor, which was my first job that <laughs> Steve Shields put me to task. Uh, you know, decided, you know, having a design degree, I thought I could probably do better than that. So I ended up at uh, the public TV station, and they were they had just lost their top audio person, who was uh, B. Morgan Martin. I'm still in touch with him, too. Wow. He's out from the West Coast, and uh, he's had quite a history. So um, I was able to fill in, and with my experience as either, you know, doing sound for the jazz bands or uh, building kits if things weren't available off the shelf at the, you know, we didn't have guitar stores back then. You know, right. Any of that. Uh, just mail order catalogs. So kind of, if it wasn't made, I could design it and build it. And, and uh, the, the, the TV station at the time had a very basic four channel tube mixer. <laughs> and they started a little music show on Saturdays right after the garden show. And they would bring in some jazz player from the east side, a trumpet player. And I would, you know, I had stuff at home that I would augment, you know, the, the lack of resources there. After a couple of years um, of, of, well, I guess after just about one year, everything seemed really compressed back in those years. Um, Bill Arhos was putting out the idea of doing a, uh, a show um, based in the new studios that had just been constructed in, I guess, early 74. Um, at the communication building, and at the time they were doing a, a children's television program called <laughs> Carrasco Lindas in the smaller, mm -hmm. I mean, they're big studios, but the smaller the studio. The larger studio was empty. It had the infrastructure, but no cameras, any of that. Um, they ended up borrowing, just using the crew and all that, bringing them down the hall and lining up. I can't remember who the first recordings were, oh, it was B.W. Stevenson was first, oh. wow. and that crew got everything set up. We uh, contacted Malcolm Harper, who brought, who was still building his Airstream truck at the time, and it wasn't completed, and so he had the console sitting in storage, that he brought up the freight elevator, we put it in the empty control room, he ran the cabling, uh, they, the, the scene department threw together a stage. Paul Bosner uh, was producing at the time with Bruce Scaife, directing, and they rented some cameras to go around to the back of the stage. And their their vision was to have a member, you know, uh, someone in the audience. Uh, well, they wanted for every camera frame to be able to see the reaction of an audience member. And I was surprised to see that uh, they had people sitting 
not only on the side of the stage, but along the back of the stage, behind the drummer, all the way around, with this right. Chapman boom floating around behind all of that. It looked pretty awesome. And then, within that first week or two, they get the call that Willie Nelson's coming to town. And so they were like, well, we'll do, we'll do another pilot. Now that we've tested all the equipment, we know how it right, works, right. Willie came in. And uh, this, the, you know, that whole team came together and you know, we had a few technical issues, but I think once we got the flames out, we continued on. And, uh, what, pilot. what were you editing on? What, were you, what was kind of bored? Were you? Let's see. This is before we actually bought any equipment, so everything would have been... That was Malcolm's. would have been Malcolm's, and it would have been an MCI 16-track reel-to-reel and an MCI console. Mm -hmm. And uh, cameras were RCA cameras. <laughs> there were three or four of those. Um, after the pilot was sent off to PBS, they said, oh, that's very good. They can do ten more just like that. And... Uh, D. Morgan Martin ended up uh, recommending the Neve. So we ended up buying a 16 channel Neve and a 16 channel Studer. And I'm trying to remember the history of the Studer. It came after having done, uh, I think somebody said, Eat a Peach album. <laughs> I'll be darned. <laughs> Oh, I don't. I can't. I haven't heard that in a long yeah, time. That's just, I'm, I don't. I can't verify that, but that's what I've heard. <laughs> so we did the first twelve seasons with those two major bits of pieces: the the, the Neve right. and the Studer. And uh, in '87 was it '87? '75 to '87. Yeah, that's about right. We we. Uh, oh, where was I? I thought we did twelve years. So that would have been 82 or 83 is when we got the 24-track Studer and upgraded the console to a 32-channel Neve, which was built by Siemens in that day. Mm -hmm. And then um, 1999 was when we made the conversion to digital console, but we were still on the Studer reel-to-reel -reel until about 2002 or 2004. Okay. And that's when we switched over to uh, digital multi-track. Right. And everything was synced, I guess, back with the MCIs. I mean, you just use a sync track with the video. Yeah, early on, sync was, was, was uh, like TTL logic kind of right. circuits that Ampex made that were pretty, uh, yeah, pretty loose. And we were, in the video we were chasing would be like a three-quarter inch machine, very clumsy and slow. But gosh, it was fun. <laughs> you know, actually mixed a picture back then, right. even though it was only 16 channels. Yeah. I met uh, Malcolm, and I, I forget why, but I went down and spent an evening with him. Yeah. He was behind the, he's across the street from Straight Music yeah. in an alley in the building behind that, yeah. doing some recording for somebody, yeah. and that's when the uh, May floods hit. Oh, yes. And the night before I was with him when that happened, I, I had no thought that they could ever recover all that for him, yeah. but they did. It was amazing. But what a hit to take. Yeah, yeah that was something else. He had his entire console and machine spread out in his front yard. Oh, really? Wow. Taking it as part as best he could, and he just washed it down with a garden hose. <laughs> Hope for it to dry. And Ampex came in and cleaned his tape or something, didn't they? Or? Yeah. They sent things off the they, best they could. <laughs> yeah. The Shoal Creek flood. Right. And that was Jay Podolnik in the truck I mean, who made the phone calls. Like, oh, the water's rising. <laughs> Malcolm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm still in the van. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> Grief. So, do you miss analog? Or I do. I still have some friends who uh, are still working on analog, and I actually have an appointment tomorrow. There's a fellow in town who's uh, just will not have anything to do with Pro Tools or digital or computers or mouses, and he has to have the reel and the tape and all that. And he bought a couple of machines from Nashville that were serviced by Steve Smith. Right. Matt Oliver is his, his name. And he was in a little indie pop band called Sound Team for a while that was signed to Sony for about you know six months and then they were released. But he's a fabulous musician, player, and he just loves to do the hands-on with right. that. And he has a Trident console and a, and a Studer. He has both Studers. He's got the A80, which was built in the 70s, right. late 70s, but it's the Mark IV that he's got, which is the top of the line of that one. 24-track. Wow. 
And, Mary, and to mix down, he's got the Studer half inch two track. That's good. You are now so totally digital, it's over the top. <laughs> now, digital comes in handy when you're in broadcast and you don't have to have something perfect. You just have to bash it out and get it out, you know, in time for a deadline. And I'm envious of my friends who can afford to maintain their analog studios, mm -hmm. and they have the diligence and the time and, and the care. And, and in a way, back when we were doing this show in analog, I, it's, I seem to remember being able to spend more time massaging and working on a mix and, uh, and getting balances together and all that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I kind of miss that. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, at the time I don't remember, you know, Right, well, appreciating it. Appreciating that, that there was some right. luxury there, but, yeah. Now it's more yeah. visual, too. I mean, now you can see more about what's going on with yeah. the signal and that, but still. And we've done some transfers for um, uh, out of the back catalog where I've been able to go through the library and bring up some of the old analog machines, tapes that were recorded in the years past, just to transfer them, just to get them digitized. Right. And I would throw up a nice little rough mix while I'm doing the dub for the, it's like attending that show once once again. Right. And just enjoying that. And some of those early shows, even the video was analog. Uh, when the tubes and the cameras were plumicons instead right. of the digital right. CCD, whatever that is, chips. and there was this effect called a comet tail, because the plumicon oh, yes. would have a time lag. Right. In the, if they had a studio light or if a saxophone had a bright polish on it and reflected a beam, as the camera moved, you would see this <laughs> tail wagging from behind it. And I realized, oh, and the colors, to me, were just richer. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I see the new digital TVs, and once it goes through compression through a cable company or whatever, it's like, Oh, you know, you see it in their faces, they're a little blotchety in right. here. It's like, oh, we didn't get that. You know, it's one of the side effects that you get in the modern age. Right. Um, typically, you know, days before the show, we get on the phone and and sort out in emails everything that's that's going on, you know, whether it's just a you know, Randy Newman and a piano, which is pretty easy. Right. Up, up to a full like widespread panic, which is, you know, sixty four channels. Right, outrageous number of inputs, and whether or not they're self-contained, whether they're bringing all of their gear, or if we're going to use what we have here. If it's a local band that's showing up in their VW van, <laughs> then, you know we've got everything here that they need. So they, right. you, know, you know, some of the medium-sized bands might have their equipment going to another gig down the road, so we need to rent backline. All that is sorted out days in advance, in advance so that. On show day, when like nine o'clock in the morning, when they open the trucks out here in the back van and start rolling in the band and equipment, a lot of these bands that are on tour are well-oiled machines because they break down and tear up and set up on you know just constantly. Mm -hmm. It's when a band is starting a tour, you know, that things can be <laughs> interesting and not be quite so right. But we've got you know the infrastructure here where they can come in. We've got the taps and the splits and all that, and it comes back in here and. You know, it's just a matter of having the time to drop a few mics over the crowd and label up the consoles and the and, uh, and the tracking recorders. And you do a sound check? We'll do a line check and then go oh. to lunch, and then they'll come back about 1.30 and do a sound check for an hour. And then the video director gets the band, uh, and if they're cooperative, which most of them are, he'll get a full um, hour run-through of the mm -hmm. entire show. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, some bands won't allow that, and so we just sort of shoot from the hip and hope for the best. And, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and other bands are very much in, into doing that just right. Radiohead was an example where they did every song, and we recorded every song, and their producer was here in the room with me, and we, and even after sound check, and they went off to do lighting when we normally have a break, we worked on those songs and took snapshots of each and every song so that when we did the live show that night it was like a live broadcast and everything uh, was just dropped in perfectly so that is really how you're operating though during the thing i mean it is like it was a live broadcast you don't exactly. you don't stop anybody or say hey we want to do something else yeah. or right and now with the internet and the possibility you know they're still working out agreements and all that 
and the permissions, but live internet streaming is a whole new thing. Mm -hmm. And that's like a broadcast. That is a live broadcast, right. but it's not on the airways, it's on the ethernet. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>